Hello there, you absolute legends. Emma McElhinney here with Piss Off Perimenopause and the musings of a bullshit queenager. I am here to ruin your misconceptions about perimenopause, fat loss and kick midlife in the face. So if you think your 40s are a drag, think again. Because every week I am going to be stripping down the myths about perimenopause. I'm serving you raw, unfiltered truths about your health and smashing misconceptions about fat loss. And a whole lot more. So if you thought you knew midlife, you don't know the half of it. Aging is inevitable, but getting old is a choice. So buckle up, grab a glass of something yummy, and let's get to it. Hello. Hi, 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 hi. And welcome to this next episode of Piss Off Penny Menopause and the Musings of a Bullshy Queenager. Her name is Emma, and that is me. I'm feeling quite bullshit this week, although I'm recording this on a Friday and I did notice earlier energy levels are a little bit lower than where they were at the beginning of the week, but mainly because it's been quite, no, I don't want to say it's a stressful week or a hard week because it's not felt hard and that's one of the benefits I suppose of doing something that you love is that it never feels hard, but it's been a, a lot going on outside of coaching. I'm trying to as uh, stupidly for right for those of you that get stuck into DIY you'll probably appreciate this so a few weeks back I was like I'd bought ages ago years before, years ago I bought these tiles in a sale um and being cute and they've been sitting in my upstairs landing for years so I decided that I was going to, I am going to do the bathroom and we had on those kind of wet wall things don't know what, we've got a special name wet wall panels and I hated them. They never just looked quite, they just looked a bit tatty. So I was like, right, I'm going to retile the bathroom. As you do. Never tiled a thing in my life. And um, the minute that I ripped off that first panel, I went, oh, you stupid idiot. You're going to regret that. I was right. I did regret it. So I've now, I've done the tiling. The tiling's done, but I haven't done the grouting. And I keep putting it off because I'm using black grout. And I was like, this is just going to be a riot. It's going to be a mess. And... Then I decided I'm going to paint. There was another wall with tiles on and I, I knew that I couldn't take them off without bringing half the wall down. So I was like, I'm just going to have to paint over them. So I painted that other wall with the tiles and the remaining walls. And the masking tape that I used around the cabinets has taken off the varnish or the coat of veneer or something on the cabinets. So now I'm going to have to paint the cabinets. And then I was like, well, I'll, I'll, paint, the, I'll paint that side bit black. Oh, maybe just paint my towel real black. Oh, maybe just get a new toilet roll holder so that's just growing arms and legs. And I'm a I'm a big proponent of list writing. So my list, my DIY list keeps getting bigger and, bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. Anyway, right, you're not here to talk about my DIY things. We're here to talk about binging. Now, I haven't actually officially titled this yet. It's probably going to be something like how to stop binging on chocolate because when I asked a very nice group of ladies, I was like, what do you want me to talk about my in my next podcast? There was a few recommendations for binging on chocolate, but what I'm going to talk about today is applicable to everything, not just chocolate. Now, I'm not particularly a sweet tooth kind of a gal. Uh, if you were to give me a family bar of Galaxy versus a family bag of cheese and onion golden wonder, I'll take the crisps every time. However, as I get older and as um, life shifts, I'm more prone to a little bit of sweetness and it is more noticeable that when I'm like, oh, I could really go with that. So anything that I talk about today can be used with any types of food. Um, and yeah, so we'll just get into it, right? So binge eating comes, binge eating, there is a thing called binge eating disorder. And that is where, that's like the kind of upper extreme of binge eating. And a lot of people do experience that. And a lot of, a lot of people are on a sliding scale of so I suppose severity. That's probably not the right word. Severity of binge eating where, you know, you get some people that are just like, it's once a month when their hormones are hitting a certain point, the sugar cravings come and they, they cannot be filled. They cannot be filled. And But it's, it's okay because it's only once in a while. It doesn't impact them mentally, emotionally um, or physically. So it's fine. And you get some people like, okay, it's a few times through the month and I can't get out of it. And it's beginning to impact me. It's beginning to make me feel rubbish. And then you get people that are can do it every day. And when it gets to that point, and it's, you know, if that is happening to you, do not stress. It's still resolvable. It's still fixable. 
Um, but the problem that we have with with binge eating is that it makes us it makes us feel out of control. And most people, most people in that I work with tend to be quite, for want of a better word, control freakies. Um, and I am one myself. And they say you attract yourself um when you're in this kind of service-based industry. And I do I, I do attract people like me. I'm I am quite a big control freak. Um and when I'm when I feel out of control, I, I don't I don't cope very well. Um, so it makes us feel out of control. It makes us feel like we've been bad and naughty. And I hear this a lot in language used when people are talking about their diet and their nutrition. They're going, oh, I was really bad over the weekend. Oh, I've been really good. But what that actually, like, what is that telling us when we use negative language like that? Actually, it, it does feed into us. And, you know, there is this whole concept of good and bad nutrition is really, really quite damaging because we've got it into our heads that good nutrition means for most people it means not enough calories not enough protein it means not enough um balance not enough variety because if you think about when you've been good with your food you're mo mainly talking about oh I was I was hungry and I managed I not I didn't eat any crap and I didn't have any alcohol and I didn't eat any crisps and that's not necessarily good um and having a, a McDonald's isn't necessarily bad either. It's all about balance. Like, what can we do consistently well? Um, so, yeah, this type of language that we're using about, you know, being good or being bad or being naughty when it comes to our nutrition is actually quite a, a big impact, has a big impact on us. Um, at times, it can make us feel quite decadent. And I certainly get like this. So like if I'm, like, I'm maybe having a bath and, oh, I'll have bath snacks and a glass of wine, actually, that feels quite decadent. So it doesn't necessarily mean that, a bad thing to do it's just it can be a nice break from routine um and in some cases it can make us feel physically uncomfortable like if you are eating to the point you're like i actually feel sick or i've eaten so much that i can't move or i have to unbutton my trousers you know that is that is a really common side effect of of binge eating behaviors um and at an emotional level it, it, it makes us feel like as well as the control element it makes us feel you know sad and angry in some cases and a bit like hopeless and these things, these things are all normal. So if you are feeling like not, nobody talks about it, like none of your friends will talk about it. And it's rare that, um, like if you went to a normal weight loss place, they would tell you, just don't have it in the house and you've just got to try harder, right? Neither of those tactics, the not having it in the house is actually really good common sense. Um, and for most people, for most people in my audience, they'll always hit back with a, but it's for the kids. Like, well, if you know that you shouldn't be eating it, why are you letting your kids eat it, right? So that can be actually quite a powerful tool is just not having it in the house. But just trying harder isn't a tactic, not really. So I'm going to take you through some ways in which some tactics that can work. But ultimately, wait, like if, you, if you're a business owner, this might make, make more sense to you, right? So we've got the tactics. These are the things that you can actually do in the moment, but you need to think bigger. You need to think, strategy long term so the biggest the biggest shift is actually deciding whether you want this behavior to continue in your life or not and some people when they get really into their gnarly little thoughts some people actually like binge eating some people it's it it's the the expectation it's the sitting down and the opening the think of the noises and think of the emotions that come with opening the wrapper or opening the crisps or the anticipation of it and if you've ever been a smoker this will make a bit of sense to you like it's not I used to smoke and it's not necessarily the act of having the cigarette that was a good thing it was the peeling off the wrapper it was going out down, downstairs from work to the bus stop and opening the, the packet and getting one out and lighting it in that first moment of inhaling and now I think back and go it actually makes me feel physically sick but that was a that was a bad habit that I had to break uh, and create new habits. And it's the same as binge eating. So the first step is actually really deciding whether you want to continue this habit or behavior or not. So if you don't want to continue it and you decide this is not going to be part of your life anymore, then great, because then you've got something to work with. Then you've got more of an inner, an inner feeling of I'm doing this. And, you know, I do need to let you know that 
this is not an overnight fix. You know, most women, if they do take part in, in binge eating behaviours, it's not something that they've done once and decided it's impacting their life so much that they need to stop. It tends to be something that's happened over a period of years. So it's completely unrealistic to expect that it's going to stop straight away. Mm -mm, it's not going to stop straight away. Right, so the first thing that you're going to do is, when I talked about, you know, is this something that you want to continue in your life? No, it's not. So this is where you're going to have to do some kind of journaling or repetitive self-talk. That This is not something that you do anymore. So you go, you know, it could be something like, I am not a person, or I am a person that eats a balanced, healthy diet consistently and don't participate in binge eating. So if you think, going back to the smoking analogy, if we talk about, think about identity and when, if you are constantly saying, I'm trying to stop binge eating or I'm trying to stop these poor eating habits or I'm trying, you're not actually confirming to yourself that you're ever going to do it. You're just, you're just trying. It's not really a commitment, is it? But if you're a, no, thank you. I don't eat that. No, thank you. I don't smoke. I'm not a smoker. That is more of a firmed up part of your identity. So that's the first bit, right? So this is not a quick fix. This is not an overnight fix. Everybody's different and there is no one size fits all on how to resolve these. And that, like, if you were my client, it would be a lot easier because we can we can talk about the exact circumstances in which you binge eat, the exact things that you eat when you binge eat. Um, so... Sorry, I'm having to, I've just thought of something that I wanted to bring up, so I have to write it down. <laughs> okay, so it's not going to be fixed tomorrow, but these tools and tactics do work and they are proven and they are not invasive. They are not overly difficult, okay? So the first thing, there's three main reasons why it happens, right? One, it's hunger. And this is really common for people who are, chronic dieters you know they're constantly on it they're constantly under eating you know if you think about your daily food if you're eating monday through friday monday through thursday say and you're eating fruit and a dollop small dollop of yogurt and salad for lunch so that's your breakfast salad for lunch with not enough protein or soup with no protein and then your dinner is like chicken and rice and broccoli chances are you're actually hungry so when we get hungry, it doesn't really matter how much willpower we're trying to ex put over ourselves, like there's not much you can do. So that's the first thing is like, are you actually hungry and are you actually eating enough throughout the day? Right. And the way that you can do that is track on my fitness pal or something, a normal three day period and see how many calories you are actually consuming. And if you're, cons obviously your calorie number is very unique to you because it depends on your height and your weight and your age and your activity levels. Um, but say you're only eating 1100 calories and you're five foot five and you're a size 12 and you're, I'm just trying to think like quite average um, and you exercise a couple of times a week and you're eating 1100 calories, right? You're not eating enough food. If you're five foot two and you're a size 12 and you don't move at all, then, you know, 1100 calories might actually just be a calorie maintenance number for you. Um, if you're 55, say. Anyway, so we have to look at, is it hunger? And so that's the first thing. The second thing, is it emotional? And how you can, like, the hunger one, you can check. There's a bit of a test you can go, like, you get to that point, you're like, I really need X, Y, and Z. Instead of having X, Y, and Z, go and have an apple. And if you willingly have the apple, there's a good, that's a good sign that it's hunger. But if you go, I don't want an apple, then it's more emotional type hunger. So is it emotional? Is it the result of something that has um, heightened your cortisol level? So something stressful. Are you exhausted? Like, are you sleeping well? If you're not sleeping well, that can be a sign of stress because your cortisol levels are higher. And that can then make us more emotionally hungry. It can actually make us more physically hungry as well. Um, is it as a result of an argument? Is it the result of boredom? So check if it's emotional. And the other thing is, is it habit? Is it happening at the same time every day? Is it happening at the same time every week, same day, time, every week? So there's three ways. Is it physical hunger? Is it emotional hunger? Is it habit? Okay. 
So they are, you need to know that stuff before you can really make changes. Okay. So if it's physical hunger or is it, if it's a result of tiredness, that's quite an easy fix. So the easy fix is if it's physical hunger and actually if it's physical hunger, you're not eating enough. That can also impact your quality of sleep and quantity of sleep. Um, it's all it's all conjoined, right? So this is why the eat, move, win metho methodology is so good because it like you've got the nutrition and you've got your movement, but then you've got the lifestyle stuff and the mindset stuff all working together. And those three elements work like cogs. And if one doesn't work properly, the rest doesn't work properly. So that's, I want you to think about everything like that. There's no like, well, if I fix my nutrition, I'll be fine. But I'm only sleeping five hours a night. No, that's not going to work for you. Like, oh, I sleep seven hours a night, but I drink three bottles of wine and I don't move. That's not going to work. It needs to all be in conjunction. Right, so um, if it's physical hunger, you want to be eating more good quality calories from nutritionally dense foods. So higher protein, more fruit and veg, less refined carbs, more whole grains, more water, right? And if you do that for a week, most people will notice huge benefits in their energy levels. They will notice huge benefits in things like bloating. They'll notice huge differences in their sleep and in general mood because you're giving your body what it actually needs to thrive. And if you're eating the right amount of calories and the right amount of protein, then you will notice that going, actually, I don't want that because I feel quite satisfied with what I've had today, not that I'm starving. Okay. If you're start if you're eating right and you're getting the right amount of protein and you're eating five portions of fruit and veg a day and you're eating you know whole grains and whatnot and you're still I really want this and it's more of a it's more of a need rather than a, I'm hungry for then it's going back into the that's an emotional um what word response or it's habit right? so in a lot of these cases it's going to be a process of elimination so. That the physical hunger is probably the easiest one to fix. Okay. The emotional one, not so easy. The habit one, not so easy. But here's what we're going to do. So, the first thing you want to do is if this, right, say, let's take an example of sitting down, sitting down of an evening after dinner, dishwasher's been put on, kitchen's tidy, sitting down, seven o'clock, eight o'clock. Oh, chocolate, I want chocolate, I want chocolate, I want chocolate, right? So the first thing you can do is change the pattern of your evening. So if your normal pattern is to do all the things and then you sit down in front of the telly, you can't do that anymore. You need to change that. You need to put, basically you're interrupting your thought pattern. So if you think about how habits are formed, does this, it does that, sorry, you can't, if you can't see me, like think of a, a line, you do this, then you do this, then you do this, then you do this, then you do this, and then you have chocolate, right? So if you can change two or three of the steps prior to the chocolate, then it's a pattern interrupt. So you maybe want to have your dinner, go for a shower, go have your dinner or go for a dog walk or go for do something that is different from what you're currently doing. So not sitting down in front of the telly because before, before the end of the, the show, you will be thinking, oh, chocolate time, chocolate time. So change the pattern. Um, Start jotting down what you are doing because one of the big insights I had quite early on in my career, this is a few years ago, and it was one of my clients and she was having a excessive binge every Sunday, uh, every Sunday evening. So I started getting her to write down exactly everything that she did every day over the weekend. So from Friday night, and what we got to was that every Sunday night, she would end up binge eating because of an emotional response to her weekly call with her mum, which happened on a Sunday morning. So if we didn't have a look at those patterns of her behaviour, like what she was doing, we would have never got to that because it wasn't immediately after she spoke to her mum. So we then changed, like she was like, okay, so we had to change when she spoke to her mum. And we had to change how she was totally. That's obviously a very personal thing. But it's. I think it's really interesting to say, well, this is the response that we have to something that happened eight hours previously. So changing the pattern is a really good technique to do. The second one is something called delay gratification. Now, studies tell us that the most successful people in the world 
have got a really high ability to practice delayed gratification in everything that they do. So they don't make decisions on snap. Um, they weigh up pros and cons. They weigh up, you know, this is going to do this and this is the risk. And they, they then make a decision. Now, delayed gratification is actually really, really easy to do. And it's a main, it's an actual tactical tool, but it's also a mindset shift. So the first thing that you're going to do is when this notion hits you, I need chocolate, I need the crisps, I need the wine, whatever it is, is you're going to change. So most people will go, don't do it, don't do it, don't do it, don't do it. And you talk, you try and talk yourself out, don't do it, don't do it. You don't need it, you don't need it, you don't need it. It's not serving me, it's not serving I don't want it, I don't want it, I don't want it. But when you've been in a pattern of, of this, you know that eventually the desire for the thing is going to overcome your willpower. And you know, willpower won't stick around forever. Discipline doesn't stick around forever. But what you do instead is you say, right, Emma, I'm going to have that. I'm going to have that chocolate. And I'm going to really enjoy it. But I'm going to have it in five minutes or 10 minutes or 15. Like set a time that is appropriate for you. And you're, But before that, I'm going to do... I'm going to go walk or I'm going to do a quick workout or I'm going to do the iron and I'm going to clean the bathroom. I'm going to do walk the dog, whatever. I has, you have to do something before it. Now, very often doing that, that's another version of pattern interrupts. You're going to do something else instead. Um, and then after I've done that thing or after that amount of time has passed, then I'm going to have it and I'm going to really freaking enjoy it. So we're no longer going to binge like we are hiding in a cupboard, like and trying to wolf it down as quickly as possible, not chewing it, not tasting it, just trying to wolf it down. We're going to enjoy it and we're going to break off that bit of chocolate one by one and going to eat it really slowly. And we're just going to taste it and check in with the texture, you know, let it melt on our tongue. Lick it if you have to, like, we're just going to change how we eat. We're not changing what we eat, we're just changing how we eat. And the minute that you start giving your brain permission to do something that you've always fought against, it doesn't be, it doesn't feel as naughty. It doesn't feel as, oh, I'm breaking the rules. No, no, no. But when you start enjoying it, you actually start to get the, feel the quality of it and don't, you do end up not wanting as much volume because you're not wolfing it down. You're actually tasting it. Your body's having a chance to digest it a little bit. You know, you're really using the full senses of the body because digestion is another interesting fact. Digestion actually starts even before you eat. So when you bring food up to your mouth and your, your nasal, your nasal passages start, they recognize it and then they start creating enzymes that start, being created in your saliva so that when you do eat the food, it's got the right enzymes to start breaking down the food for more effective digestion. So we're going to not just wolf it down and swallow it whole, we're going to eat it properly. And when we really enjoy it, you know, you've given yourself permission to have it, you've got to enjoy it. And then when you are doing this delayed gratification, it's really, really, really important that you spend a minute, you know, you can just jot down how did I feel before this craving hit me? Was I nervous? Was I anxious? Was I tired? Was I bored? How did I feel when I ate the food? Did I feel bad? Did I feel guilty? Did I feel sad? Did I feel angry? Did I feel hopeless? Whatever. And how do I feel now that I've done it? Because the more that you start paying attention to these things, the next time it happens, you might not feel as the urge is strong because you know that you've got more control over it now because you've had more control over it in the past when you said, right, I'm going to have it in 10 minutes and I'm going to eat it slowly and I'm going to really enjoy it. You had more control then. And then suddenly your brain goes, oh, I'm controlling this a bit better. Mm, that's interesting. So that's a really powerful one. And the other one that's really good, if you, if it's a particular thing, so say it's chocolate, um, and I t I've told this, this um, story before about a client, one of my clients was a fiend, actual fiend for chocolate hobnobs. And she would eat chocolate hobnobs, full packet chocolate hobnobs. Now, if you don't know about chocolate hobnobs, they are delicious, but they're also probably the most calorific biscuit in the world. And it gets to the point you're like, is it worth it? Like, I don't know if it's worth it. Anyway, so what we did was instead of trying this delayed gratification, when she got the notion for the chocolate hobnobs, I prescribed that she ate two chocolate hobnobs every single day. 
even if she didn't want them. If I don't want to eat them every day, like tough shit, you're eating two chocolate almonds every single day. And when we start normalizing some of the foods that we're eating and accepting that we can eat these foods as part of a balanced, healthy diet, it takes away that kind of, you know, the whole shiny red button uh, test that they do with toddlers. Like you put the toddlers in the room and tell them not to press the button. Um, and most of them press the button. But when you take away that whole, I can't have this, I can't have this, and actually make it part of your day-to-day life, it suddenly is just another thing that you can eat that's fine and then you don't have the cravings the only time I would say not to do that is with alcohol because you want to be giving your body a break from alcohol if you you do drink quite a lot you want to be having you don't want to be drinking multiple days in a row you want to be having daily breaks from alcohol um so alcohol is a little bit more of a, a nuanced um topic so that can be a really powerful thing so if you're trying to not eat chocolate and then you eat a family bar of Daily Milk in one sitting and you're like, oh, oh, I feel actually sick. And oh, start having a Fredo every day or a crunch every day. I've got a client that's eating a crunch every day. Stop our binge eating crunches. Um, so all of these different tools can be really, really powerful. Um, but the most, Im- most important thing to remember is this is not an overnight fix and it requires effort. And that's... People don't want to put an effort to this type of thing. Yes, they'll go, I don't like it. I don't like it. I don't want to do it because it's making me gain weight. It's making me feel disgusted in myself. It's making me feel out of control. But I don't want to put the effort in. But these things aren't necessarily overly difficult. It's just It just requires consistency of implementation. And there'll be some days that you forget. There'll be some days that you're like three quarters of the way through a family bag of kettle chips and you'll go, oh, fuck, I forgot to enjoy these or I forgot to implement delay gratification. That doesn't mean you've fucked up. It just means you've forgotten. So you just do it the next time. Just put a reminder on your phone or write it down going, I'm really disappointed that I forgot. And the fact that you're actually writing that down means it's more committed to memory that next time when you do it, you're like, oh shit, yeah, I need to do that. Okay. Right, so I hope that's helped you today. Um, what I'd love for you to do is if you do need support on this kind of stuff, happy to help. I mean, we do, we work with clients with this type of stuff all the time. Um, you know, relationship with food is part and part as part and parcel of what we do ultimately, because you know, most people, if they're in a place where they're trying to lose body fat and they're trying to have more energy and they're trying to get their body confidence back and they're just trying to feel manage some of these perimenopause symptoms through um lifestyle. You know, relationship food is a big, a huge part of it because, you know, most people are in their 40s and their 50s. That's a long amount of years that we've been around food. So, yeah, if you did need help with this and this is what we do as part of our coaching, then you can drop me a message. Um, Let's just say ready sent or interested. That seems to be my two trigger words. Um, And we can have a quick chat about your history, about your background and your goals. And I can recommend what's best for you. Um, And the other thing that I want you to do... oh. Fucker, I never said at the beginning. Like, share, and comment, please. Let's have, let's uh, share the love of the podcast. Um, the second thing that you can do, you can go ahead and download. No, you can't. You can go into Amazon and buy my Happy Hormone Handbook. I will pop that link below. It's eight ninety nine on Amazon. Hard copy. I really loved writing it. I really think. Well, people have bought it. Told me they love it. So, um, it's got quite a funky cover as well kind of nice um so yeah i'm gonna gonna go and you can buy that it's a lovely hard copy and i will see you in the next episode of piss off perimenopause and the musings of a bullshit queenager i'll speak to you soon and just like that we have spiced up another episode of piss off perimenopause and the musings of a bullshit queenager massive shout out and a huge thank you for hanging out with me today i really hope you've been entertained and remember don't be shy hit that subscribe button and until next time keep those heels high and standards higher remember it's all about glowing growing and downright owning it so catch you on the flip side and don't forget to click the link in the show notes to get your freebie